When you run a sample on a flow cytometer, you collect several signals that give you information about your sample. For example, say your instrument uses PMTs. In this case, light must be converted from photons into volts to be measured. But there are several types of detector systems available, and there are differences in how these detectors operate. Light detectors operate under what is known as the photoelectric effect. The first demonstration of the photoelectric effect was carried out in 1887 by Heinrich Hertz, who used ultraviolet light. But the photoelectric effect is mostly associated with Albert Einstein, who relied upon the photoelectric effect to establish the fundamental principle of quantum mechanics in 1905, for which he received a Nobel Prize. So in general, we use photodiodes for forward scatter and absorption, and until recently, PMTs were used for fluorescence and side scatter, but in the last few years things changed and other detectors are being used. Most flow cytometers use a simple diode detector for forward light scatter. This one is from an older EPIX instrument which uh, used a simple silicon photodiode, which was literally a piece of light sensitive material. Since the forward scatter signal is huge, this is all you need for most particles. And in this image you can see the sensors above and below the obscuration bar. Some instruments do use PMTs if they want to detect very small particles. So silicon photodiodes are really cheap and they're generally used in the amplified mode and in most cases they are the devices used in flow cytometers to collect forward angle light scatter. Let's discuss silicon photodiodes. Firstly, a silicon photodiode produces current when photons impinge upon it, and an example of that would be a solar cell. They don't require external power source to operate, and their peak sensitivity is around 900 nanometers. At 900 nanometers, the responsivity is about 0.5 amperes per watt, and at 500 nanometers, it's about 0.28 amperes per watt. They are usually operated in the photovoltaic mode, which means no external voltage. Alternatively, they can be operated in the photoconductive mode with a bias voltage, which is fairly common in flow cytometry. They have no gain, so they must have external amps. They're very cheap, they're not quite a dime a dozen, but almost. Next, avalanche photodiodes. These are silicon-based structures. Photodiodes are the semiconductor analogs to PMTs. Typically, APDs apply a high reverse bias voltage of around 100 to 200 volts, which allows for a gain of about 100 to 1,000. But more recently, gains of around 100,000 can be achieved. Most APDs are more sensitive in the higher wavelengths from 450 to over 1,000 nanometers when the light enters from the end side of the silicon. There are some gallium nitride based diodes that can operate in the UV space using a reversed P side of the silicon giving sensitivity in the 200 to 800 nanometers. Silicon devices are sensitive to thermal effects and so they have a high level of shot noise making them less useful in very low noise applications. So a little more about APDs. What's the fundamental difference between a PMT and an APD. So as noted before, APDs are very small little devices, often looking like a tin can with a window on the top, and PMTs, as you've probably all noticed, well, they're much bigger. So why would you change to APDs when everyone else is using PMTs? A major advantage of APDs is the high dynamic range, about a million compared to about 10,000 for a PMT. And another advantage in an APD is that this huge gain is almost perfectly linear. APDs are about 10 times cheaper, maybe more than 10 times, and are more economical. And another big difference between an APD and a PMT is the bias voltage. We often need 600 to 2000 volts for a PMT, whereas many APDs require only 20 to 100 volts, and it's not continuous like the HV has to be for a PMT. Although some APDs in some instruments use around a thousand volts for their high voltage. And another important thing, a great reason to use APDs, is the almost 90% quantum efficiency compared to maybe 20 or 30% for a PMT. So remind me, what is an APD again? APDs are silicon photodiodes with an internal gain mechanism. Absorption of incident photons creates electron hole pairs. A strong internal electric field is then created by a high reverse bias voltage. And you can see that 
that on this drawing. This field accelerates the electrons through the silicon crystal lattice to produce secondary electrons by impact ionization. And the resulting electron avalanche produces a very high gain. So if you think of what happens in a real avalanche where a small ball of snow builds up to a powerful event, you get the gist of what is happening. So the big deal about APDs is their incredible quantum efficiency. Remember what QE is? Quantum efficiency is the photoelectrons emitted divided by the incident photons. So efficiency is important, and even more important is the wavelength range that APDs can handle. Depending upon which type of APD you select, you can get from 200 to 400 nanometers or 600 to 1000 nanometers. So properly designed APDs can provide excellent results, maybe even even better than PMTs. APDs are so small that you can arrange many detectors very close together. So let's discuss photomultiplier tubes. First, they produce current at their anodes when photons impinge upon their light-sensitive cathodes. They require external power source. Their gain is as high as 10 to the 7 photoelectrons out per photon in. Also, noise can be generated from thermionic emission of a electrons and this is what we call dark current. The spectral response of PMTs is determined by the composition of the photocathode. If it's bialkali then that PMT has a peak sensitivity around about 400 nanometers. If it's multi-alkali the PMT extends to about 750 nanometers. So how does a PMT work? Here's a typical glass type PMT. This one has a side window where the photons come in, they hit the cathode, and then you see the dynodes going down to the anode, which is positive, and it is the dynodes where the high voltage is applied. The current comes from the anode, and this is converted into a voltage, which is plotted on the screen, just like the histograms that you typically see. And if you look on the left side of this figure, you'll see that the frequency range is different for the bialkali PMT and the multi-alkali PMT, which is slightly higher. The spectral response depends upon the materials the cathode is made from. These days, PMTs look a lot different to those used in the 1990s. So what's inside a PMT? First, there's a controller circuit that usually produces between 0 and 1 volt, and that drives the high voltage. And generally, 0 0.1 volt from the controller circuit is equal to 100 volts of high voltage. And then there is what is actually an amplifier, which is composed of a series of dynodes. The photocathode has a photosensitive surface, which releases electrons when struck by by photons. These photoelectrons then strike a metal channel dynode. Each dynode has a high voltage applied to it. At the other end of the dynode chain is the anode, and the current flowing from the anode to the ground is directly proportional to the photoelectron flux generated by the cathode. The spectral response of the PMT is determined by the composition of the photocathode. The best efficiency of a PMT is about 30%. PMTs can also be multiplexed, and this is a typical PMT from Hamamatsu that was used in the first Purdue spectral flow cytometer and also in Sony's spectral flow cytometer. It has 32 cathodes, so that is like having 32 PMTs in one. Some instruments only use PMTs, some only use APDs, and some have both PMTs for lower wavelengths and APDs for longer wavelengths. Some instruments have a lot of PMTs. And finally, some PMTs are huge. These PMTs are about 20 inches in diameter, and 11,200 of them line the Super Kamiokan detector in Japan. Now that is a PMT. The last group of detectors is the SIPM devices. These are silicon photomultipliers, often called SIPMs. They are solid state single photon sensitive devices based on single photon avalanche photodiodes, often abbreviated as SPADs, which are implemented 
on silicon substrates. SIPMs can operate under Geiger mode, which means they are specifically designed to operate with a reverse bias voltage well above the breakdown voltage. SIPMs typically have several hundred to thousands of detectors in an array. Some operate at room temperature, so they need very large surface areas to be effective. Others have smaller surface areas but are controlled to minus 30 degrees C so they have very low noise and can have extremely high speed. I left the last group because they're the most modern devices and I believe they represent the future of flow cytometry. The next generation of instruments will be totally quantitative and it won't depend on analog technology like all instruments do today. Even instruments we call digital are actually analog instruments with digital electronics. Yes, one day we'll have single photon detection flow cytometers. Every photon will be measured and we will finally, after all these years, have true quantitation in flow cytometry. So let's summarize. Detectors in flow cytometers are mostly diodes or PMTs. Photodiodes are mostly used for forward scatter. Photodiodes are more sensitive than PMTs, but because of their low gain, they're not as useful for low level signals because they have too much noise. PMTs are usually used for fluorescence measurements. PMTs are sensitive to different wavelengths according to the composition of the photocathode and dynodes. PMTs are also subject to dark current and are very light sensitive. High voltages in PMTs are not always linear across the entire range. APDs, on the other hand, are almost perfectly linear. APDs are also cheaper and are the most efficient detectors. SIPMs are the next generation of detectors. They can detect single photons. Well, thanks for listening to this Cytorial. I hope you subscribe to Cytometry Man on YouTube.